So let me start the final session of the conference and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Gianfranco to those who don't know him already. Uh, Gianfranco is a very precious member of our team. He was present in all the discussions about how to formulate the project. Uh, and, uh, there, uh, plays, played a huge role in the final shape of, of the project. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing this presentation. Uh, Gianfranco Ferrari is born in Messina, Italy. His current research focuses on forms of conversion approach through several points of observation, philosophical, literary, theological, political, particularly through the studies of Michael Foucault and Pierre Adot. On these topics, he wrote several essays, particularly concerning Foucault, Nietzsche, the history of utopian thought, and he's also working on a theoretic, uh, theoretical volume. He's currently coordinating the research thematic line on conversion, education, and global pedagogical utopias at the Center for Global Studies at the Universidade Aberta, Open University in Lisbon, Portugal, where he's also a PhD candidate on global studies with a research project on the ancient roots and the modern influence of Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual, spiritual exercises. Previously, he studied philosophy in Italy, Pisa, and France, uh, in Paris, where he obtained his PhD in philosophy with the thesis on the notion of ascetism in Nietzsche, Weber, and Foucault, and was FCT postdoc fellow in Portugal. He is founder and editorial director of the international journal Thomas Project, a border journal for Utopian thoughts. And he co-edited with Marco Faustino uh, the book, The Late Foucault, Ethical and Political Questions, and with Antonio Carreri, the volume Formas de Conversão, Filosofia, Política, Espiritualidade, so forms of conversion, philosophical, political, uh, spirituality. He, uh, philosophy, sorry, philosophy, politics, and spirituality. He's coordinating with José Eduardo Franco, The Global History of Utopias. Uh, he has also translated into Italian modern and contemporary works of the utopian uh, tradition. And the precise title. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, well, so, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, of course, I don't say that uh, it's a great pleasure to be presented by uh, uh, by. Uh, <laughs> But, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a different lapsus, but it's a really a pleasure and an honor also uh, to, to say uh, we among uh, some friends, some colleagues, uh, and uh, some uh, old masters, I, uh, I, some teachers that I, I appreciate and I admire probably. Um, well, I go to, uh, to, my, to my presentation. Um, just to uh, uh, really uh, take all the time that I have uh, in my <laughs> disponibility. Uh, so, uh, what is at stake in uh, a philosophy of a way of life or uh, a way of living uh, philosophically can be inferred by what uh, Gerardo and Michel Foucault say when they refer to the way in which uh, in ancient and modern times philosophy touches life. They agree that uh, living philosophically uh, has something to do with the field of uh, the spiritual. And they agree uh, when saying that the core meaning of the spiritual consists in the ability to transcend and to transform the forms of life. In this sense, if we can testify of several forms of a non-philosophical spirituality, we cannot have a philosophy as a way of life without spirituality. In his core essay on uh, spiritual exercises, Pierre Adolf defines them indeed as practice that, that involve a complete reversal of uh, uh, our usual way of looking. Excuse me, Jeff Franco. Sorry, we are still on Zoom, so we do not see the file. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 
That's okay, in line. Yes, yeah. thank you. Sorry, sorry if we sometimes uh, uh, forget, you know, this, uh, but this double presence, you know, and the physical, and not physical. <laughs> yes, uh, it's difficult it's, for everyone. <laughs> yeah, so probably this pandemic uh, has not created a new civilization of a non-physical presence. <laughs> so I say that. Um, in his court essay on spiritual exercise, Pierre Adol defines them in the as practices that involve a complete reversal of our usual way of looking at things. We have to switch from our human vision of reality, in which our values depend on our patients, to a natural vision of things, which replaces each event within the perspective of a universal nature. Such a transformation of vision is not easy. And it is precisely here that the spiritual exercise comes in. For Adu, the notion of spiritual exercises expresses the specific form assumed by philosophy in antiquity and recovered in certain strands of modern thought. As an art of living, philosophy becomes, uh, I quote, a concrete attitude and a determinate lifestyle which engages the rule of existence. As such, the philosophical act is, uh, at all, Iris, a conversion which turns our entire life upside down, changing the life of the person who, go, who goes through it, and raising the individual from in, an inauthentic condition of life, darkened by unconsciousness and harassed by worry, to an authentic state of life. Equivalent to or uh, interchangeable with this kind of philosophy, these practices I are characterized by Ado as the ritual. Ado justifies his use of uh, an expression that he uh, admits uh, as disconcerting for uh, the contemporary reader because it covers all the aspects of the reality. Hence, these exercises are spiritual because. Uh, only this adjective emphasizes the extent of the transformation of the subject who involves them. The aim of such exercises is a transformation of our vision of the world and, as I said, a metamorphosis of our personality. Precisely because the spiritual implies the involvement of the individual's entire psychism. Uh, rather than mere thoughts, it reveals the true dimensions of these exercises. To complete the definition, Ado adds a final Hegelian consideration. Through spiritual exercises corresponding to an act of uh, transcending oneself, and I quote, the individual raises himself up to the life of the object spirit. That is to say, he replaces himself with the perspective of the good. At stake in a spiritual exercise is a, a type of work or a schedule, the aim of which is to transcend the individual, the spirit at the suke, also in an immanent sense or eventually in an immanent sense, so as to assume the perspective of the world. After all, following uh, Rabov and Freeman, as uh, John Sellers remembered, Ado is uh, careful to distinguish this philosophical notion of spirituality from the religious one. As such, this spirituality, as an experience of transcendence, does not necessarily belong to religious practice and can therefore be used in ways that transcend them. This form of a spiritual philosophy or a philosophical spirituality knows as an historical break, according to Ado, precisely with the advent of uh, medieval scholasticism as uh, Matteo remembered, an uh, advent which uh, corresponds, we can add, also with the advent of the material form of uh, academic institution. And I quote, with the advent of uh, medieval scholasticism, however, we find a clear distinction, with, uh, a distinction being drawn between theology and philosophy. Theology became conscious of its autonomy qua supreme science, while philosophy was emptied of its spiritual exercise, which from now on were relegated to Christian mysticism and ethics. Reduced to the rank of a handmaid of theology, 
philosophy's role was uh, henceforth to furnish theology with conceptual and hence pure theoretical material. Uh, well, according to Foucault, uh, what can be defined as the ritual is a common element of uh, philosophical, ethical, political, and religious traditions concerning the different practices related to the care of itself. As a genealogy of uh, the care of itself, the hermeneutic of the subject can be interpreted as a, a true genealogy of Western spirituality, a genealogy of the relation between the philosophical, religious, and other forms of the spirituality. And as characteristics of the spirituality, Foucault mentions for facts the following. Spirituality postulates that the truth is never given to the subject by right. Spirituality postulates that the subject as such does not have a right of access to the truth and is not capable of having access to the truth. It postulates that the truth is not given to the subject by a simple act of knowledge, a naissance, which would be founded and justified simply by the fact that he is the subject and because he possesses this or that structure of subjectivity. It postulates that for the subject to have a right of access to the truth, he must be changed as form shifted and become to some extent and up to a certain point other than himself. The truth is only given to the subject at the price that it brings the subject's being into play. A second aspect of Western spirituality mentioned by Foucault concerns conversion. Course. Foucault clarifies that from this point of view, there can be no truth without a conversion or a transformation of a subject. Conversion takes the form of a movement that removes the subject from his current status and condition, and this in two ways. The first consists of an ascending movement of the subject himself, the second of a movement by which the truth comes to him and enlightens him, enlightens him. I think I want to start this uh, work. The third, the final aspect of Western spirituality, according to Foucault, concerns the rebound effects, namely the effects of the truth on the subject. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, if I call this philosophy, then I think we could call spirituality the search, practice, and experience through which the subject can result the necessary transformation of itself in order to have access to the truth. In short, and in conclusion of this first part, Fourado and Foucault, what characterizes a practice as spiritual is the aim of transforming the subject. When these practices of transformation are connected with an access to a non predetermined truth and to the right action, spirituality becomes strictly philosophical. If it is true, as Ado and Foucault suggest, that we need to approach spirituality as a, an independent notion, a better philosophical notion, the type of philosophy that informs the way of living cannot be detached from spirituality. To philosophize means to assume a perspective that tests the limits of ourselves and of ourselves as the world in which we act as agents of text. It is what we call named as a critical ontology of ourselves, a form of living that bound to truth it recovers by exploring, for instance, and not, not only, but for instance, the ancient forms of uh, parasia. The parasias, I take this uh, quotation from The Courage of Truth. The parasias gives his opinion. He says what he thinks. He personally sings, as it were, the truth he states. He binds himself to this truth, and he is consequently bound to it and by it. But this is not enough, for after all, a teacher, a grammarian, or a geometer may say something true about the grammar or geometry they teach, a truth which they believe, which they think, and yet we will not call this by reason. From this perspective, we shall should the puzzle to test ourselves and the conditions in which our philosophical act or world is uh, is given. So we go to the part through uh, part two and. Uh, uh, we 
from this perspective, uh, uh, again, to, uh, to uh, approach something that uh, is uh, in continuity somehow with what uh, uh, Matthew Sharp was saying uh, before. Um, the main paradigms of a modern uh, university as it is uh, drawn at the beginning of uh, the 19th century can be clarified as follows. For first, we encounter the paradigm of the Prussian, Prussian University as projected by Alexander von Humboldt, then the paradigm of uh, uh, the French Ecole Normale, and finally, the English and American colleges and universities. What characterizes the also differentiated develop, development of the three forms of university is the direct connection with the needs of the state. Modern universities are born following the necessities of the modern state as an essential ganglion of the state structure, precisely with the aim to grow up the executive elite. In this form, humanities have uh, a, pivotal, a pivotal function, that is, the function of organizing and somehow direct the academic structure. In this organization, humanities and philosophy in particular assume the role of constructing the academic discourse. The positivistic term in which natural sciences apparently conquest the very leading role does not, uh, did not modify to the inner organization. Philosophy uh, claims soon its role, becoming the philosophy of science or philosophy of history. Philosophy maintains as such the role of expressing the relations among the different kinds of knowledge. Although with the improvement of the scientific and technological advances, natural science and humanities increase more and more their distance and their specificities. But the organization of the academic world and the modalities through which the academic world is expressed remain substantially unchanged. The relation between academic knowledge and power continues to be deeply influenced by the organization of a modern science. Philosophy as practice cannot move differently, founding its legitimacy in the constellation of what Foucault determined as the complex relation between the savoir and pouvoir, knowledge and power. Therefore, it is a precisely this condition, uh, this, it is precisely this, the condition encountered by Nietzsche in 1974, what may definitely decides to leave his philological profession to follow his uh, philosophical conversion. As known, Nietzsche's choice does not result into a philosophical um, professionalization within uh, the academic space from which, after all, he came from. In Schopenhauer, Nietzsche found his educator precisely because he finds in him a philosophical practice which is uh, distanced from the impositions of the state. Of the state. The main aim of philosopher and of the educator can be revealed not through words, rather through an example of a living. Schopenhauer's reading has on Nietzsche an impact which overturns his system of values, but which at the same time helps him to focus on himself and to rediscover what is at stake in the human being as such. Not for a case, Pierre Aldo makes of Nietzsche's Schopenhauer as, as educator a canonical example of what we can uh, see in interpreted as philosophy as we all have. For Nietzsche, educators' aim is not that uh, of imposing their world or their well-being on their students, rather to show how to live. In this sense, educators' impact on their students, as was Schopenhauer's impact on Nietzsche, should have precisely the characteristics of a goal to a philosophical conversion. And a quote from Schopenhauer as educator, your true educators and formative teachers reveal to you that the true original meaning and basic stuff of your nature is something completely incapable of being educated or formed and is in any case something difficult to access, bound and paralyzing. Your educators can be only your liberators. Similarly, in the preface of a, a first book of Human to Human, <laughs> Um, to much mean, Nietzsche uh, describes the great liberation through which the young soul moves to its form as a free spirit. 
the great liberation comes for those who are thus fettered fetter suddenly, like the, like the shock of an earthquake. The youthful soul is uh, all at once convulsed, torn loose, torn away. It itself does not know what is happening. A drive and impulse rules and masters it like a command. A will and desire awakens to go off anywhere at any cost. A vehement, dangerous curiosity for an undiscovered world flames and flickers in all its sense. To show the relevance of Schopenhauer's figure, Nietzsche show choices as polemical opposite, precisely the academic model of philosophy, and more clearly, his contemporary model of learning. A learning system which, he points out, had its roots in the medieval academy, academia. The material scholar still appeared indeed as the aim of the perfect education. Hence, the third perilous, I quote, the third perilous concession which philosophy makes to the state appear as knowledge of the history of philosophy. This makes of the philosophy just a learned presenter of what others have thought, and had to ask that he will always have something to say his pupils uh, do not already know. In this context, it appears as very difficult to substitute the old rules with a new idea. Which kind of philosophical, uh, all the philosophical freedom is possible indeed within a state's university? Nietzsche argues. Consider more closely that freedom with which, as I have said, the state now blasts some men for the good of philosophy is no freedom at all, but an office of profit. The, promo the promotion of philosophy nowadays consists, it seems, only in the state's enabling a number of men to live from their philosophy by making of it a means of livelihood. Nietzsche takes care in specifying that uh, whether truth is served when one is shown a way of living of, uh, of it, I cannot say in general, because here it all depends on the quality of the individual who is shown it. It is clearly possible that, that the, to a philosopher results possible to have an agreement with her society or her state. Nevertheless, there is a condition and a risk. According to Nietzsche, the condition sine qua non uh, concerns the aims of the state and of the philosopher. They must consider the risk is that if the premise is not guaranteed, the philosopher becomes a simple function of, state, of the state's machine, and each appears as particularly afraid of this. Because, I quote, every state fears them and will favor only philosophers he does not fear. Hence, the state never has any use for truth as such, but only for truth which is useful to it. More precisely, for anything, whatever useful to it, whether it be truth, half truth, or ever. A union of the state and philosophy can therefore make sense only if philosophy can promise to be unconditionally useful to the state. That is to say, to set, to set the usefulness to the state higher than truth. It would, of course, be splendid for the state if it also had the truth in its pain and service. But the state itself well knows that it is a part of the essence of a truth that never sets pay or stands in anyone's service. The risks of the agreement between state and philosophy appear to Nietzsche too much higher. His conception of philosophy as something that should transform the ways of believing above all of union of new generations appears as being the final in contrast with the aims of the state. Even as long as this officially recognized the will of self-thinkers continues to exist, any activeness of a true philosophy will be brought to note or at least observed, and will suffer this fate through nothing, nothing other than the course of the ludicrous which the representatives of that philosophy have called down upon themselves but which also strikes at philosophy itself. 
Um, that is why I say it, it is a demand of culture that philosophy should be deprived of any kind of uh, official or academic recognition, and that say an academy will relieve it of the task which they cannot encompass of distinguishing between real and apparent philosophy. What Nietzsche defines is indeed a spiritual practice of philosophy aiming to transform the existence through a free choice and an only rupture with a model. If the opposition to academic philosophy appears as a, as a speculator to the promotion of a philosophy as we all are, the well-being of philosophy rooted in the truth cannot coincide with the well-being of the state. As point of reference of Foucault's and Adult's conception of philosophical spirituality, also this fracture point out by Nietzsche should be taken into account. So more recently, in 1994, also, uh, also Pierre Bourdieu, in his uh, sociology of a modern academia, reflected on this topic, analyzing in the French context how different forms of power conditionate the expression of a free uh, research. Um, the deep resistance to, innov to innovation and to intellectual dimension, the aversion for ideas for freedom of spirit and the criticism that so often orient the academic judgments, both in his discussion or in reviews, or much in caps of so balanced by not side with the one or the other avant-garde at the moment, are probably the effect of uh, the acknowledgement accorded to an institution capable of giving statutory guarantees. Those guarantees are attributed to those conforming to the institution, only to those who accept without knowing it the limits set by the institution itself. And nothing contributes to the strengthening of the provisions focused to more than one doctoral thesis. This via the widespread control that the heritage of authority of the father of the doctor tends to exercise on all practices, in particular on publication through self-censorship and the obligatory reverence for masters and academic production. And above all, through the prolonged relationship of the dependency, in which the candidate is kept and uh, which does not have a very, very often nothing to do with technical needs of a true apprentice. Bourdieu is also careful in explaining the risk that the humanity is running in a similar context, precisely that of accepting, accepting and being uniformized by scientific and academic rules which over-determine the expression. Bourdieu writes indeed of a rhetoric of scientificity, any academic discourse can pretend indeed its legitimacy only when based on specific criteria. It is what he calls a science rebound that only can give to a discourse its specific social value. Nevertheless, these three criteria are, on their hand, determined by the historical conditions in which they are defined and in which they pretend to predetermine the scientific parts. It is important thus to sociologically, and maybe we could add uh, philosophically, understand how the scientific criteria are determined, as well as clarifying the social interests, defining the social norms on which these criteria are rooted. According to Bourdieu, it is uh, pivotal to approach scientific and academic criteria as a specific result of a struggle of uh, representations. In this sense, uh, scientific representations, that is, uh, those representations socially recognized as uh, scientifically true, conquer, conquer a social purpose. They give to those who uh, practice them a sort of a trust, a monopoly, concerning uh, the legitimated point of view. The risk concerning the unquestionable position of this scientific criteria is that we can often encounter self verifiable provisions. In this way, nothing more can be added beyond what is socially recognized as scientific. Rather, there is not any intrinsic strength of a truth, but only a strength in the faith of a truth, in the belief that a which appears as a truth. Now, if natural sciences are more aware uh, than humanities 
of the constitutive weakness at stake in the evolution of scientific paradigms, only social sciences and humanities can really question what Foucault defined as being the forms of a prediction of a discursive practice as the scientific discourses are. Not for anything, but because of this consists the main aim of humanities. Also in this case, the defense of the philosophical autonomy from any heteronomic condition shows its relevance in order to defend the same independence of society itself. Now, apparently from the past, uh, which state uh, government, no, the diversity, from the academic model of philosophical practice in which state plays a most relevant role, Contemporary academy, academia has its own basis, just not in the aims of the state, quite in terms of the market, no? as, as we know. Um, well, if we want to be a bit more precise, Nietzsche had already pointed out uh, what he calls in Schopenhauer as educator the greed of the money makers, one um, of the powers promoting a culture with second hands and not the disinterested fairness. In this case, uh, I just quote a little, a little, education would be defined by its other ends as the insights, uh, the insight by means of which, through demand and dissatisfaction, one becomes time bound through and through, but at the same time, uh, best acquires all the ways and means of making money as easily as possible. The goal would then uh, uh, be to create as many current human beings as possible in the sense in which one speaks speaks of a coin as being current. And according to this conception, the more of these current human beings he possess the happier and national being. Thus, the sole intention behind our modern education institution should be to assist everyone to become current to the extent that lies in his nature, to educate everyone in such a way that they can employ the degree of knowledge and learning of which they are capable for the accumulation of the greatest possible amount of happiness and profit. Of course, we can infer what it means when the social cost of the culture is, as a end in our times, transferred from a social responsibility to the individual. As a letter similarly argues in our the depth of the living, in its very form, in its various forms, that has become the premise of a current mode of subjectivation, and as such, needs to be reproduced rather than repaid. Than repaid. Sorry. Neoliberal transformation of the state into an entity providing services also redefined indeed the space into which humanities encounter their possibility of expression and of educating new generations. Neoliberal economical political approach transforms the system of values to which collective organisms should be oriented. As Foucault explained, it is not just a matter of government, rather a matter of government government. The neoliberal model pretends that only the individual should be considered as the actor of the process. Foucault explains extensively what is at stake into this process. The individual embodies the characteristics of a free will without having a true possibility to be concretely free. Individual freedom becomes more an illusory projection hidden by its that. As well known, in the last two decades, most of uh, the university system in uh, Western countries, but not uh, exclusively, have created several schemes of promotion, which are increasingly based on uh, some sort of uh, measurable academic outputs, which are usually materialized on formal papers. In order to scale up the academic ladder, Publishing in highly ranked journals has increasingly been recognized as the coin of change. This has resulted in the well known publish or perish paradigm, which most academics since the very beginning of their career are obliged to follow. For an institutional perspective, this responds to the heavy reliance on bibliometrics measures to quantify academic prestige as most of the operativization of the academic accounting perpetrated by rankings. In fact, an aggregate more research, uh, an aggregate more research outputs constitute an important reward 
to climb the academic ladder leading to university to play with the ranking appointing higher than you know with academics we are saying. Now, as a precisely Matthew Sharp and Turner and his team argued in a very important article on this topic that I suggest really to uh, approach. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, what you do, but uh, everyone had the right to, to his photo. So, <laughs> also you had. <laughs> But well, <laughs> where previously no such possibility exists, metrics from Mars, to do, it was the only photo I found on in the internet. <laughs> uh, from Mars to document the art, the numerical truths about the conduct of individuals across any range of activities, while leaving these individuals formally free, precisely, uh, to pursue their tasks and enterprise themselves. And with the such methods, meanwhile, managers and their decision making prerogatives are liberated from the direct need to attend or to comprehend the contraband concern, specialized knowledge, and responsibilities of the aligned workers. In order to achieve its explicit aim to define a rational scientific ranking of a publication when applied to the humanities, the publish or perish paradigm reveals itself as intrinsically irrational. Taking into account the non coincidence between humanities and social and uh, naturalistic epistemologies, the paradigm results into, indeed, into a real heterogony, heterogony of the planets. In fact, by tightening the forms of a research and academic discussion, it defines an order of discourse as the only legitimate to be practiced in academy. academy. The restriction of the regimes of discourse results so into a new disciplinary model of an academic subject, precisely a special subject, as Charles Taylor said, and unable to critically approach the historically and the interdisciplinary methods needed by humanistic pedagogical curricula. On the prosecution of Foucault's and Bourdieu's studies, Sharp and Tarry identified the effects of uh, neoliberal policies in the connection between the liberal capitalist social relation and the kind of quantitative measures or human conduct that metrics from eyes might might seem direct and unchanged. Marx are competitions, and competition must have winners and losers. In order for different parties to be so ranked, some common measure or a university, universal equivalent of metric is required, starting from mind itself. And understanding how neoliberalism reacts, whether it's a liberal predecessors, also allows us to see the political, economic causes behind today's veritable explosion of forms of metrics reaching from uh, biometrics via bibliometrics even into the separate groups of academia. Proliferating metrics and today's uh, bibliometrics can indeed, in a Foucauldian perspective, show the instance of a neoliberal management of technology. We can add as examples of uh, the academic application of uh, the projecting financing method, which uh, make uh, lose any disinterestedness of research or the improvement of a, a hyper specialistic education that make which makes lose, particularly in the case of humanities, the attitude to approach reality and current problems in that complex way that the, the same academic curricula publicly present as the core of humanistic parts. The authors also show uh, how the basis of uh, the bibliometric scientific criteria are rooted into a well-determined social construction. The construction of a bibliometric criteria accompanying, accompany indeed, the social improvement of the expertise trained through the same metrical criteria. So when quality is reported to quantitative metrics, all that is not definable through those criteria automatically is left to the relevance and to the marginalization. Bibliometrics do not need, of course, to question themselves as the minorities do. So this was, uh, there's a, uh, um, there's a narrated uh, by Charles Garner, by Bourdieu, 
This was the reality to which uh, moved uh, academic organization when Jacques Derrida pronounced this conference on a university development condition in 2001. Derrida explained what he considered as the utopia of a modern university, and in particular of uh, humanities and philosophy within this kind of uh, humanity, of uh, uh, university. University claims and ought to be granted in principle, besides uh, uh, what is called academic freedom, an unconditional freedom to question and to assert, or, or even going still further, the right to say publicly all that is required by research, knowledge, and thought concerning the truth. However, enigmatic it may be, the reverence to truth remains fundamental enough to be found, along with lightness, on the symbolic insignia of more than one university. The university professes the truth. And the thief, and well, it was precisely the reference, the conflicts, the counts, the conflicts of uh, factors um, on which we have debated before. Uh, the university profess the truth and the thief, uh, its profession. It declares and promises an uh, unlimited commitment to the truth. No doubt, the status of, of uh, and the chain um, of, and the change to the value of truth can be discussed at the infinitum. But these are discussed precisely in the universe and in departments that belong to humanities. As such, university and humanistic departments for first should be the places where the struggle for all truth is given. Their freedom and the freedom of truth, of course, precisely depends on the capacity to maintain these characteristics. The principle of uh, the unconditional universe or the university without condition is precisely the right to say everything, whether it be under the healing of fiction and the experimentation of knowledge and the right to say it publicly, to publish it. Nevertheless, Trinidad argues it has never been in effect. This principle indeed exposes also, and I quote, the weakness or the vulnerability of the university, its importance the fragility of its defenses against all the powers that commanded the siege and attained to appropriate. Indeed, a university without condition is a necessary stranger to power because it is heterogeneous to the principle of power. The university is also without any power of its own, of its own because of its own independence uh, that uh, would be its strength, this university cannot be, cannot be otherwise than without defense. Derrida almost, Derrida almost fears as if uh, the same principle of university was under attack. To what extent does the organization of research and teaching have to be supported? Is it directly or indirectly controlled? Let us say, a formistically sponsored by commercial and industrial interests. As we see also in the case of the Derrida, the problem remains the same of Bourdieu, Sharp, but also Bardot, how to define a free philosophical practice, that is, a philosophical practice directly concerning the philosophical problem. How to defend a philosophical practice that is capable to give to itself its own ability to exercise a criticism without, without conditions. In this, precisely, in the unconditionality, we find the unique premise by which an academic knowledge can have an agreement with a philosophical practice thought as a way of life. As a disinterested spiritual activity, as argued by Ado and Foucault, that of the regards clearly a utopia with the same characteristics of every, of every utopia. It uh, intrinsically criticizes the forms of the normal to let reality mirror itself. As in the case of any utopia, its uh, strengths does not necessarily reside in a realization. What is uh, needed uh, then is not only a principle of resistance, but a force of resistance and of difference. This force seems to indeed be concatenated to humanities. This principle of uh, unconditionality presents itself originally and above all in the humanities. It has an originally unprivileged place of a presentation of a manifestation of a safekeeping in the humanities. It has there a space of discussion as well as of relaboration. 
For this reason, it is a pivotal for Derrida also to question what professing means, which kind of responsibility and of freedom beyond the simple knowledge is at stake in the figure of the professor. Only humanities can recognize, moreover, as their own task, the investigation on what can be known and thought about their history. To critically approach their meaning and their historical institutionalization, humanities should never renounce to study their history, that is, to understand the conditions through which a configuration of thought and practices was born, as well as to understand the conditions of a possibility to recreate themselves through other configurations. In this, Derrida and Foucault clearly agree. Of course, it is not for the leader a mere question of a theoretical approach, rather a performative practice, practice based on the insistence of an expression that has this do something of autonomy, as if. Like all acts of institution, uh, those that we must analyze will have, um, will have had a performative force and will have uh, put to work a certain as if. I just say that one must study or analyze it. Is it necessary to make clear that the, such a study, such analysis, for the reasons already indicated, would not be purely theoretical and neutral? They would lead the, towards practical and performative transformations and would not forbid the production of a similar herb. Thinking uh, by as if, as a, a drop on the rock, imperceptibly but uh, decisively, has the strength to modify institutions, practice, and way of thinking precisely as it uh, already happened throughout history. Is it possible to imagine a revolution without uh, an uh, as if? And uh, is it possible to imagine otherwise, uh, otherwise, um, otherwise our forms of living without an uh, as if? This force in uh, keeping uh, with an experience of the perhaps uh, keeps an affinity or a complicity with a if of the as if and that with a certain grammar of the conditional. What if uh, these arrived? This that is uh, altogether other could well arrive, this would appear. Like the ancient memento mori, the as if, the ridas as if, could be present in a modern hypomnematon as a remembering of the unconditionality of an existence. Moreover, it can open to its proper unconditionality and institution, those of humanities in particular, where nothing more than the existence is uh, at stake. This way, uh, one cast out just on the very limit between the inside and the outside, not only the border of the university itself and within it of the, the, the humanities. Win thinks in humanities uh, the irreducibility of the outside and of their future. One thinks in the humanities that one cannot and must not let oneself be enclosed within the inside of the humanities. But uh, for this thing to be strong in consistence requires humanities. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But, well, I, I know. I know. Yeah, 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 of course. So, Mm, in reference precisely to the utopian proposal of Derrida, also uh, Pierre Rado, Pierre, Ma Pierre Macheret wrote about the academic <laughs> work in La, Par La Parole Universitaire, uh, beginning from a previous uh, clarification. The current form of university is increases, and at the same time, Macheret remembers that the constitutive aspect of the university is its crisis, as remembered by Kant's conflict of, um, uh, of faculties. Uh, so, one of the ways to practice the tension is inner to the uh, university is to make a genealogy of the academic forms, to recover, for instance, those forms of uh, academic organization that the Western civilization experienced, experienced before modernity, as were the cases of the medieval academies or the 18th century academies. It is uh, re relevant to recover indeed the simple fact that uh, academies or university are born as an aggregation of teachers and scholars that made the community precisely based on their common desire to learn and to experiment a certain form of living. The genealogy, um, genealogical recovery of uh, these spaces recovers somehow something 
uh, of that unconditionality I like spider reader as well as something of the decent test is in is in Yes, <laughs> on which Ado had based his conception of philosophy. Um, so we can try to observe our uh, university and in particular the social and cultural organization of our humanistic institution through the lenses given by Ado and Foucault. We have some difficulty to find uh, that uh, possibility of philosophical spirituality taking culture in antiquity but also in modernity. The differentiation between what is a philosophy as we like and what is not, the debates on why and how it disappears from Western philosophical tradition should be not um, be simply based on the differentiation of the different approaches or on the breaks between life and field. Medieval scholastic, according to Ado, the calf reason, according to Foucault. The conditions in which philosophy is practiced, the institutional apparatus appear as being equally determining factors. A critical ontology of us as practitioners of philosophy needs as a critical study of the relation between philosophy and its institutions. Based on the very aims of the state or of the market, our institutions and the philosophy conceived as we were in seem to be condemned to a, a def the definitive dissonance. The Rida and Machere try to let us imagine a possibility to question the unconditionality of the university and of uh, the academic world recalls some possibility from the past and obliged to open the doors to the outside. Uh, philosophy as well life is uh, an outsider practice and is this probably the reason of its great social success that all of us can testify. Outside of the universities, there is a great demand for love. On the other side, we improve the presence of the philosophy of real life in our university. We accept academic current um, governmentalization by submitting articles of philosophy of real life into ranking journals. We publish with scientific editors, so we gain projects, we speak about it in the conference. Are we responding to the academic reasons of the university through philosophy of real life? Are we opening really universities to the Rida's utopia or to adults and Foucault spiritual philosophy? I was reading about this question when I recognized the risk we face in Gramsci's notion of a passive revolution. By this uh, notion, Gramsci describes uh, those form of a conservative restoration in which something of the revolutionary social demands are accepted within a field that is transformed only illusory. Moreover, the social needs are only partially accepted without observing the very causes of a crisis or of a discontent. The outside is just integrated, any challenge is realizable too. The as if is substituted by an as usual. An example of this can be found in a recent report of the Oxford University, also at Alfonso Line. Also, it uh, underlines the relevance of humanities for the universities. The critical approach of humanities is uh, completely neutralized. Humanities careers, this report says, open a path to success in a wide range of employment sectors. Hence, the academic world risks just to change its object. Of course, to see the risk corresponded in itself to observe the outside, to practice the unconditionality of uh, humanities. If humanities and philosophy in particular can be defined as the disinterest of the research to promote transformation of the way of living, even to convert uh, ourselves to beings which are for ourselves unsuspected and definitely free, only free academic world and university without condition seems to be able to realize this utopia. As Voltaire said, at the very end of his candid, one must cultivate one's own garden. It is a, a provocative mention of a conservative expression, used in this case as a, an exhortation to Chris. To let Candide say what is expected, he says, to reveal the given conditions means to make a, a passive revolution simply impossible. If according to Foucault, enlightenment basically consists of a specific attitude, the same which opens uh, the unconditionalities of knowledge to the university and the encyclopedia, 
Voltaire's revolutionary dissidents on the best of the possible words is practiced through a non speculative way. Voltaire's attitude can surely be considered as a philosophy of life lies. Um, at note, Voltaire created in truth his own garden, inspired by Epicurus and loathing as Epicurus. His garden was a critical institution, open to the real, to life as it is. To cultivate gardens corresponds to to create institutions. Can this, uh, um, can this one is not the Voltaire's one. The garden of the ancients and of the moderns was such as, as uh, a realized utopia. And as the utopias usually make, also the utopia of philosophical gardening provoked the needing for new gardens, ways of living philosophically of the following generation. So, the last question, and I will conclude with this, with many apologies for my late, which is then the garden which we can understand. Thank you very much, Antonio, for the very meticulous discussion. Uh, since you talked a little bit more than uh, the time needed, so we have less time for discussion, so we have around five minutes for discussion. I would ask to, uh, I think we'll join three questions, and I already see three hands, and I'll ask you to, um, to be quick in your answers and to be as quick as possible also in, the, in your reply. So, John, please. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much. So you covered a lot of very interesting ground. So um, here's a, a quick comment, which is very much from a UK perspective, because obviously things are different in different countries. So in terms of the pressure to publish, absolutely, I can't get a job unless I publish, and I can't get promoted unless I publish even more. Um, but there's something else that's even more fundamental, which comes back to your comment about the marketization of higher education. So far more important than whether I get promoted or not is whether I manage to keep my job. And that is dependent on student recruitment, because the students pay fees and whether the department can continue to uh, afford to to hire people but it is dependent on whether we attract students, right? So that's the, the neoliberal context, right? The state doesn't care what we teach, but we really have to offer something that will be appealing to 17-year-old stu prospective students, right? That determines whether we keep our jobs, right? Now that sounds horrific, and in many ways it is. Here's the silver lining. Despite the ideology, in the wider culture, most 17 year old prospective philosophy students don't care about their future employment prospects. They want to study existentialism, they want to study Nietzsche, they sometimes want to study Stoicism. Um, increasingly, they want to study Indian philosophy and Chinese philosophy. Um, the good news for all of us is that most of the things that the average 17 year old philosophy student wants to study is stuff that would fall under the idea of philosophy as a way of life because they're looking for some kind of guidance for what to do. So that, you know, that might be a silver lining for the prospects of how philosophy as a way of life could flourish with the institution. Um, so yeah, just to... So we should... Thank you. I think so, but no, so I'm close to your last thank you, John Sanders. Yeah, you better, you better, you better. Great. Thank you, Jim. Frank. May I play here some uh, devil's advocate? Uh, the devil's advocate. So I would say that, that maybe it seems to me that uh, you are conflating different uh, problems. Uh, for example, um, the problem that you, you are, I get you the uh, that you, you took Nietzsche and Nietzsche's critique of the, the state and, and the relation between state and philosophy, or not philosophy, but the philosophy as, a, as academia, as academic job. And the, the, the more, I think it's more a problem in the UK than in Portugal, the, 
smart marketization of, of uh, public universities or universities in general. The, the metrics, is, I think I, these are two different problems. So let me just uh, uh, give you some critical remarks uh, about this. But I will be yeah, I'll, I'll very, right. very, very quickly. Really, uh, I just uh, um, I tried to show uh, two different forms, of course, of uh, um, correlation between philosophy, between philosophical institution, and uh, the, for, the, the force that govern uh, or uh, by which the philosophical institution depends. So, of course, uh, in the first case, uh, Nietzsche uh, uh, is uh, uh, on, on tests, uh, no, that relation between the state and uh, law and philosophy, because state was the the, the main uh, force of government. In the second case, uh, we have uh, uh, Bourdieu, Charpentier to contest you know, the current form of uh, governmentalization you know, of uh, philosophy. But for example, Nietzsche's, uh, Nietzsche's critique of the, of the state seems to be very anachronistic because that, that, that is here that I play the example. Okay? Because I would say that without the state, without the state, because in, in Nietzsche's time, I mean, uh, some non-liberal, I'm not talk talking about neoliberal, I'm talking about liberal societies where the state, this is the public university, the state, the public university has autonomy. Yes, we I, can study what we want the way we want. The state that uh, dictate what, what, so the state, we are here thanks to the uh, state, the state is funding our, our research. So I understand the problem. We are, we are, we are, in, we are in the, we are now not in the situation that, that, that uh, we are nostalgic of uh, the Mm, situation uh, lived by by Nietzsche. The problem is not uh, to uh, for me to take uh, in this moment, you know, to to prefer uh, which was uh, the best uh, the best condition, you know, for philosophy. I just uh, shown uh, through these uh, several authors uh, which is the main problem for them uh, in the perspective of, of course, of Ado and uh, and Foucault, no? which is the problem. The problem is that uh, how to make uh, a philosophical world, a philosophical practice uh, free of any condition. Mm -hmm. And of course, the state, the, the state, the government of the state is a condition uh, make uh, the philosophical price condition in a certain sense. Uh, our neoliberal market uh, conditions our practices uh, and our uh, ability, our capacity to express philosophy. So, to different conditions, to historical different conditions, but uh, conditions. So, we have to uh, take care about uh, about that in a different way. Nietzsche makes uh, on the, on uh, on his own. Bourdieu uh, and Foucault uh, and Lord Derrida. Uh, of course, uh, taking take into account the different historical conditions, and uh, but we can, we can look at Nietzsche's at Nietzsche, uh, that particular text of Nietzsche and other texts as uh, presenting uh, you, you romanticized Nietzsche a little bit. He left academia because he was sick and he had a, a pension uh, reform. Uh, so he does a, he, one of his best, maybe his best work. He, 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 he has written it. Yeah, I, I, quoted, I quoted Nietzsche because uh, he's uh, uh, an, example, as a figure, he's an example given by Adobe. Uh, <laughs> Adob. We, we can look at Nietzsche's vision of, of, uh, of the relation between the state and the as being very elitist. As being, uh, so it, you, you can, yeah, okay. Uh, the, we, we want to promote this free thinking, but this is. Uh, the, some of the problems we are experiencing today, they, they, they... Yes, yes, but I, I, quote, I quoted the several authors. Nietzsche, of course, uh, uh, yes, was an Alex author, Derrida, not, uh, Foucault, not, uh, I think that also uh, other colleagues are not elitist. So I just uh, have shown the different critics that can be done. We uh, that uh, that you to account. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, Eva, could you, is it a quick question? Because yeah. we are uh, uh, about the relationship between, uh, yes, about the relationship between a cloudy and constitution, I would uh, recommend uh, uh, the future, maybe it could be useful, the idea of Robert Sponsito uh, on uh, uh, Vitam Instituere. 
because here could be a very um, important the relationship between philosophy as a way of life uh, and then the, the relationship between philosophy and life and the relationship between institution and life in the sense that the, 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 the life itself would be, should be instituted. What is thank you. Thank you very much. I add just uh, the same that, for instance, also by putting a both term, the problem is uh, to imagine uh, this exactly or the imagine not to, to the discard the any institution uh, of our lives. The problem is to reimagine uh, our institution differently or imagine institution institution of the future. Thank you very thank you. much, Jennifer. Thank you all for the discussion.